Hello. Good morning. Hello. How are y'all today? Good. It is thanks. It's Thanksgiving week, right? So you guys don't have to go to school tomorrow. So that's good, right? Oh, you're going to camp. Well, that'll be fun too, though, I bet. Well, who knows? Why are we off from school this week? Why do, what holiday are we celebrating? Because it's Thanksgiving. That's Sunday. right. Because it, well, it's, it's Sunday today, but this week we're celebrating Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving was uh, celebrated the first time because the pilgrims were having a really hard time uh, in a new land, and it was not going well for them. And the Native Americans helped them. So they had a banquet to celebrate the bounty that they had because they were helped and they were praising God and thanking God for all that they had. What time is it now? <coughs> time is it now? I don't know. Um, I have a friend Hollow book where all our friend Hollow animals have a midsummer banquet. Oh, they have a banquet too, huh? That's so cool. So we're gonna we're talking about the Thanksgiving banquet today. And so I thought I would teach you a song because it's important that even now we remember to be thankful for all the things that God has given us. So I know this song is gonna this song is gonna really help you be thankful for a lot of things. But first I have to teach you the chorus, okay? So here's the chorus. This is how it goes. That's what Thanksgiving is. Can you guys do that with me? <coughs> that's what Thanksgiving is. You guys have to help too. Okay, yeah, that's right. And then, this is the fun part. Like, wait, 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 wait. And then the next part, the fun part for you is, um, there's a trombone part in the song, but I don't have a, but I don't have a trombone, and I don't play the trombone, so you guys get to help me be the trombone. So this is how, the, and you guys too. Everybody has to do it. All right, so this is how the trombone part goes. Burp, burp, burp. Okay? Are y'all ready? Let's do it together. Burp, burp, burp. So we put it all together. That's what Thanksgiving is. Burp, burp, burp. All right, here's the song. Are y'all ready to listen for the song? All the things we ought to be thankful for. Here we go. You've got to be thankful for the Bible, Jesus, and your mom and dad, for your bike and for your clothes and for your butter and your bread, for your shoes and socks and under things and all the clothes you wear, and be thankful for your nose and for your hair. And for your That's what Thanksgiving is. Burp, burp, burp. You've got to be thankful for your eyes and ears and fingers and your hands, for your legs and for your arms and for the folks who understand. For your music and your books and for your teachers and your school. And be thankful that you're warm and that you're cool. That's what Thanksgiving is. Burp, burp, burp. you got to be thankful for your food and for the turkey and the ham. you got to be thankful for the milk and cookies, jelly and the jam. For the road and for the car and for the bus and for the drive. And you really got to be thankful you're alive. That's what Thanksgiving is. Burp, burp, burp. You got to be thankful for the sun and moon and wind and rain and air, for the bed and for the bath and for the table and the chairs, for the friends and for the toys and TV and the radio. Yeah. And be thankful that your record player goes. Do you guys know what a record player is? Yeah, yeah okay. Burp, that's what Thanksgiving is. Burp, burp, burp. You got to be thankful for your dog and for your cat and for your horse. How many of you have a horse? Well, I don't have a horse. <laughs> you have fishies? Oh, here, got to be thankful for the fish and for the pretty birds, of course. You got to be thankful for the flowers and the forest and the lawn. And you understand we could go on and on. That's what Thanksgiving is. Burp, burp, burp. Awesome job, you guys. All right, so we have about a million zillion things like you said right you said a zillion things that you're thankful for i'm thankful for my you're thankful for your fishies i am yeah, i'm thankful for my fishies you're thankful for everything all right well i tell you what we have so many things to be thankful for why don't we thank god for all the things that we're thankful for okay can you help me thank god for all we're thankful for let's pray dear god 
thank you so much for all the wonderful gifts that you've given us. Thank you for a holiday to celebrate all the things that we have. Help us to remember to be thankful even when we don't have a whole lot of things. Help us to remember to help other people who don't have things. Um, God, we are so grateful for this bounty. Be in our hearts this week as we celebrate you and we celebrate your goodness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So not only is this Thanksgiving week, but today we are celebrating Christ the King Sunday. And Christ the King Sunday is the last Sunday on the church calendar. Next weekend we start again with Advent, so it's like Happy New Year's to uh, our uh, church calendar, right? But today, since it's Christ the King, we're also, along with being thankful, we're going to talk about kings a little bit. Um, and so when you look up what is a king in the dictionary, you look up king, the definition is a man who rules a country because he has been born into a family, which by tradition or law has the right to rule or the title given to such man. Or a male monarch of a major territorial unit, especially one whose position is hereditary and who rules for life, a paramount chief. <coughs> so, um, these are the words of A.A. Milne. He has a description of a king, too, for, um, for some of our younger folks. And this poem is titled, If I Were a King. I often wish I were a king and then I could do anything. If only I were king of Spain, I'd take my hat off in the rain. If only I were king of France, I wouldn't brush my hair for my aunts. I think if I were king of Greece, I'd push things off the mantelpiece. So he wants to be a cat, essentially. If I were king of Norway, I'd ask an elephant to stay. If I were king of Babylon, I'd leave my button gloves undone. If I were king of Timbuktu, I'd think of lovely things to do. If I were king of anything, I'd tell the soldiers, I am king. So this poem might be a little bit silly, but I think it's, it describes mostly the kind of king that we think of even as adults. The kind of king who in the Middle, middle Ages ruled over the lands and had total control and say over what happened. Sometimes those kings were gracious, sometimes they were not. Many let the power go to their head. Many were king by birthright. You were born into that position and people vied and tried to get family members, and there was even, you know, killings to help that family member come next in line, and all sorts of crazy things. Some were elected, as was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, um, incidentally by his uncle, Prince Frederick of Saxony, who uh, helped him get elected, and then later was instrumental in protecting Martin Luther from his nephew, the Holy Roman Emperor. The point is, however, that most of the time when we think of a king, we think of someone who has sovereign rule. We think of someone who can make all the decisions, whether good or bad, for the people. And with this power comes great wealth and privilege. If we look back into the Old Testament, we'll find that kind of king as well. Originally, from the time of Moses until the time of Samuel, who was a judge and a prophet, the rulers of the Israelite people were judges. We have a whole book of the Old Testament dedicated to the history of the judges and the people. Moses was a judge, as was his father-in-law, Jethro. And judges ruled a little differently. Their job was not to have ultimate say over the people. The Israelites actually had a very egalitarian system. The priests were responsible for the religious aspects of the people, care for the temple, sacrifices, the Ark of the Covenant, and so on. The judges were responsible for interpreting the law, which had been given to Moses, to make fair and equitable living, to make people live freely and be in great relationship, loving and caring relationship with one another. However, as Samuel, the judge, grew older, he made his sons judges, and they became very corrupt. They took bribes and did lots and lots of bad things. And so the people asked instead for a king to succeed Samuel. They wanted, to be, they wanted a king so that they could be like all the other nations around them. Interestingly enough, the nations that they had conquered. 
The problem was God had set up their community to be different from those nations. God had set up their community to look to God as king, king of creation, depend on God for their needs and for God to provide them as they had hap- as had happened in their escape from Egypt, in their wandering in the wilderness, in their reclaiming of the promised land. Samuel knew that having a king was a bad idea, and he tried to tell the people that it would disrupt their way of living. But he also went to God and shared their demand, and God warned Samuel that the people, and the people, that a king would end up taking all the power eventually, wanting more, claiming things as their own, taking the best of what everyone had, and eventually some may even take the people as the king's slaves. But the people refused to listen, as was common of the Israelites. And so finally the Lord answered, saying, listen to their voice and set a king over them. <clears throat> and so Saul, and so Samuel went and anointed Saul to be the first king. And so the Israelites entered into a time in which there were a few good kings and a lot of bad kings. And eventually, their poor rulership and the people's following of them as earthly kings, rather than depending on God and following what God had taught them, they ended up in their land being conquered again. Their kingdom was split into two, the north and the south. They were eventually exiled, their temple destroyed And things went kind of sideways for the Israelite people. And so it's with these notions of king that then we enter into today's gospel story. Today's gospel is the account of Pilate questioning Jesus as to whether he is a king. Pilate attempts to assess whether Jesus claims to be king of the Jews, since that's what he's been hearing from the people who have betrayed him and arrested him and sent him to Pilate. Jesus' answers are evasive. Uh, He answers that his kingdom is not of this world. Smart choice. So he's not going to be threatening Rome by saying it's not of this world, but he's actually not lying either. And again, Pilate tries to assess his guilt as king, but Jesus answered that he's come to testify to the truth. So what he's come for is to testify the truth and that people listen to his voice But he doesn't ever really say, I'm a king. And so Pilate sees no case against Jesus, but the Jews insist that Jesus should be put to death for claiming his kingship, so to speak. Of course, they are threatened by Jesus. Their power is threatened by Jesus. But they have no authority to put him to death, so they have to come up with a reason for Rome to put Jesus to death. And so Jesus is handed over to be crucified. The question for us is, was Jesus a king? Is Jesus a king? As Christians, and as people who are celebrating Christ the King Sunday today, we would solidly say yes. However, Jesus is not the same type of king that we would typically think of. Because Jesus has shown all through the gospel that his time on earth was not to rule as a king, that his time on earth was not to have all the power, but to equalize power, to show that everyone is equal in God's eyes, that all are worthy of God's love and mercy. A typical king in the eyes of the Jews and the Romans at this time would have all the power. They would have wealth and slaves, but Jesus consistently rebukes earthly power and wealth in treating everyone that the last will be first, and that to be greatest of all, one must be a servant to all. And this is not the picture that we normally think of when we think about a king, is it? And yet we celebrate Jesus as king because Jesus is king, king of the universe. Jesus came not to conquer people, but to conquer death and sin. And this Jesus does not through power or wealth, Not through armies and battles, but through love and kindness, teaching and healing, death and resurrection. And so perhaps instead of a king, 
as we heard in our children's poem earlier, a better description for us would be found in one of our timeless hymns, Lead On, O King Eternal. Lead on, O King Eternal. The day of march has come. Henceforth, in fields of conquest, your tents will be our home. Through days of preparation, your grace has made us strong. And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease. And holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. Lead on, O King Eternal, we follow not with fears, for gladness breaks like morning wherever your face appears. Your cross is lifted over us, we journey in its light. The crown awaits the conquest, lead on, O God of might. We do not have a Jesus of battles and of conquering people, but a Jesus who conquers death and loves all. Amen.